our subject is the end of time. And I'd like, if possible, to look at this and the subsequent chapter, chapter 25, this evening, which we cannot do except by adopting a kind of um, uh, a Bible, expanded Bible reading method of analyzing the chapters. But here is Isaiah now speaking about the destruction of the present world order, followed by the great song of praise of the people of God. Now, uh, very often young Christians think that uh, you must turn to the New Testament for all your information about the last things and about the return of Christ and the day of judgment and so on. But of course, there is a very great deal taught in the Old Testament also, and this chapter is one of the greatest of them for describing the last judgment in very Isianic terms. So I'm going to give a number of headings and we'll go speedily through the verses. And first of all, my first heading, the destruction of the present world order. And here in verse one, behold, see, says the prophet. He announces this great prophecy. The preceding chapters have run through the judgment of various nations who oppressed Israel and including the judgment of Judah herself. But now, uh, this is a chapter about the judgment of all the world, as we see. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty. See the announcing word. And then everything is ascribed to God. The great act, the final, the long promised act of God at the end of time is about to be described. The Lord maketh the earth empty, a waste, clears it entirely of people, but uh, with the exception of a remnant, an elect number, but we'll see as we go through the chapter. Maketh it waste, turneth it upside down, makes it unrecognizable, and scattereth the broad, the inhabitants thereof. Where's abroad? This word um, suggests to some people that this is a, just a judgment of the land of uh, Judah, that this is perhaps the beginning of the captivity. But no, it goes way beyond that because the things that are described here did not happen when the children of Israel were taken into captivity. And repeatedly, this is spoken of as referring to the whole world and all the inhabitants of the known world. Well, scattering abroad the inhabitants means that people are swept off the earth and reserved for judgment, as it were. The judgment itself is not described, but the destruction of the earth at the end of time. And then verse two, and it shall be a fascinating verse, as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servants, so with his master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, and so on. And you see this tremendous reduction of everybody to the same level before God, because in judgment, God is no respecter of persons. The wealthy with the poor, uh, people losing all their status and entitlement all that such things being dissolved. And it's not a, a new kind of society that's being described. It's an act of God as everyone is reduced to the same level before him under his gaze and under his judgment. And verse three, the land shall be utterly emptied. This really is the end. An exception will be made for the redeemed just shortly, but otherwise the land is emptied and utterly spoiled, as if destroyed. For the Lord hath spoken his word, just a word of God, and all the mighty 
and whatever is the prevailing empire in the last moment of time, however great its power, one word from God, and it's all at an end. God hath spoken this word. It is going to happen. And now in verse 4, the earth is uh, pictured as a, a widow or a widower and uh, in mourning or uh, a mother who's lost her children. The earth is uh, personified and it's seen as if in tears, mourning, and it loses all its strength and vigor. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world, look at these terms. This is universal. Earth, the inhabited earth, the world, it's reinforced constantly, languisheth. It has no resistance. It cannot resist, and it fadeth away. And the haughty people, the greatest people, the rulers, they're emptied of strength and languish. And verse 5, the earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have, and this is the reason it's a moral judgment, because they have transgressed the law of God. Indeed, they've changed the law of God. And we often note that we see that especially in these very last days, the changing by nations, even of moral laws of God, and turning them upside down. And they've broken the everlasting covenant. And although that could refer to and include the covenant that was made with the Jews, with Moses, it applies to the creation covenant of God. God works in covenants towards men and man at his creation was placed under a covenant. He smashed it, he broke it. It's of no help to him now that original covenant of works, but actually it's still in force. Man will still be judged by it. When Christ came to redeem us, he had to keep the original covenant of God, as well as the Mosaic covenant. He had to honor the law of God. But the covenant here means that understanding that God is to be recognized and God is to be bowed to. That's the everlasting covenant. And it's been smashed. This is a moral judgment of the world. And then down in verse 6, Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth. The curse that came in the Garden of Eden. But now this is its ultimate expression. Everything dies and uh, man is under judgment. They that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned. First reference here to burning. The elements we read in Second Peter, shall melt with a fervent heat. And few men are left. You see at the end of verse 6 there, there'll be several references building up in this chapter to the remainder or the residue that are saved or the remnant is a more biblical word. And few men and women left Everyone else will be held aside, cleared off the earth, held aside to judgment. But there are some who survived that. Verse 7, the new wine mourneth, the vine languisheth, all the merry-hearted do sigh, all causes of gladness and music and joy. In verse 8, it comes to an end. As far as this world is concerned, the remnant will sing, but no one else. All contrived jollity, verse 9, they shall not drink wine with, with a song. Strong drink shall be bitter to them that drink it. All has come to an end. Verse 10, the city of confusion, the word, Hebrew word translated confusion there, 
uh, can equally be translated desolate, and it's translated as desolation a few words later. The city of confusion or desolation is broken down. All these figures, every house is shut up. Well, of course it is. If there's general fire and the surface of the earth is wasted and people are cleared from it, but why refer to every house? It's, we may take that for granted, but uh, uh, it communicates something to us. There's no rest now. It's like a criminal. And the police come and arrest him at his home for a serious crime. And he's taken from his home. And he's going to be imprisoned and on remand. And he's going to stand trial. But that last glimpse of home, that's all it's going to be. He's committed serious crime. You'll never see home again. That's the idea here. Every house is shut up. This is total destruction. There's no going back home. There's no rest now. There's no rest before judgment. A few moments or days, as it were, of remand. And that's all. And verse 11. There is a crying for wine in the streets. All joy is darkened. The mirth of the land is gone. In the city is left, here's this word again, desolation, and the gate is smitten with destruction. The gate of the city, well, that stands for its identity and its security, and it's smashed down. And verse 13, when thus it shall be in the midst of the land among the people, there shall be as the shaking of an olive tree and as the gleaning of grapes, when the vintage is done. And this is going to be a reference again to the redeemed or the saved. At harvest time, they shake the trees and the fruit falls and it's harvested. But uh, there's usually fruit left for later gleaning. There's just a residue. And you come back later, the poor particularly, as they do with the grapes, and they glean what remains. And that's Isaiah's way of picturing the remnant. This is a judgment. The tree is shaken now, not in harvest, but in judgment. And the fruit, as it were, that's the souls of men and women falling. They'll now stand judgment. But then there's a second visit by the harvester. And there's a residue. It's the remnant of God's people. Then a second heading for our thinking this evening, the survival of the redeemed. Well, verse 13 has already mentioned them. Verse 14, they, the redeemed, the second harvest, as it were, the gleanings of the poor, the residue, the remnant, they shall lift up their voice they shall sing for the majesty of the Lord. They shall cry aloud from the sea. The sea is the nations of the world and from all over the world, though there's tremendous commotion in destruction and judgment, the song of the redeemed will begin to be heard. Verse 15, wherefore glorify ye the Lord in the fires, the glowing of the destruction of the world, the redeemed come forth and they glorify him. Even the name of the Lord God of Israel in the isles of the sea. And verse 16, I hope you don't mind going at this pace to give us an overview of the whole marvelous prophecy. From the uttermost part of the earth, Verse 16, God's saved people are going to be found in the last day in all nations of the world. From the uttermost part have we heard songs, even glory to the righteous. So there's the great song of the redeemed. But halfway through verse 16, Isaiah in 
seeing this vision, in seeing all this take place, he cannot yet join in the song of those redeemed. He's shocked by what he sees. And so there's the but. But I said, my reaction to this, says Isaiah, is my leanness, my leanness. Woe unto me, the treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously. Yea, the treacherous dealers have dealt very treacherously. Isaiah has a personal moment of intense grief. He sees the destruction of the world. He sees the emergence of the redeemed from its ashes, their tremendous song of praise, and he's suddenly caught with a spasm of personal regret and grief. Why? Well, obviously, because he laments the wide-scale destruction, people including those who he has tried to reach in his ministry and warn. They affected some of them to listen, but they didn't really, and they never repented, and now they're lost. But even more he's grieved to see the ravages caused by these people who he describes as the treacherous dealers, the deceitful dealers, the purveyors of lies and false teaching who have blinded so many people and it's such a grief to him. And here they are in verse 16. All the forces of humanism and unbelief and Islam is there and Buddhism is there and Catholicism is there. The treacherous dealers. The inspired word says they know they're deceiving and tricking. The treacherous dealers have dealt very treacherously but it doesn't take away the responsibility of each individual who comes under judgment. Then the figure changes in verse 17, just a little. Now all those people who were so proud, the treacherous dealers and unbelievers, now are like uh, the leaders of them, are like people hunted, Fear and the pit and the snare, hunting factors, are upon thee, O inhabitants of the earth. And it shall come to pass, verse 18, that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the, in the snare. There'll be no escape for anyone, however articulate, however, elusive in speech, there'll be no escape for anyone. Verse 19, the earth is utterly broken down, the earth is clean dissolved, the earth is moved exceedingly. Three ways in which the earth is destroyed in, in Isaiah's language. It's broken down, it's dissolved, it's moved, shaken. It's been pointed out that these could all be figures of burning as uh, components of the Earth's surface break down and parts appear to dissolve, melted in fervent heat, and the whole Earth itself is shaken. Verse 20 picks it up. The Earth is like a drunken man, and it shall be removed like a cottage and for cottage, read a hut. That's the idea of the Hebrew. A hut in a great gale is so easily blown down. Everything gives way to God's judgment. And the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. In other words, Isaiah reminds us that he's speaking in uh, 
figures, in illustrative language. What's really going to crush people in the day of judgment is nothing physical, but the weight of sin will somehow in God's judgment be so manifested, people will be crushed by their guilt. And these figures are as far as we can go in human language to convey that. But it's a moral judgment. So when you read Isaiah, don't think so much in terms of rocks being hurled down mountains and crushing people and huge gales. That's the language. But it's the language to get across the effect of the crushing nature of the realization and the burden of guilt which God administers in the day of judgment. Verse 21 brings us to another heading, the judgment of demons. Celestial spirits, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. These kings are another way of talking about the high ones, the demons of darkness. And we're reminded of Ephesians 6, 12, and the principalities and the powers. And at that time, verse 22, they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days shall they be visited. So at the last judgment, not only will people be swept off the earth, and reserved for judgment, but devils also. And then, verse 23, shall the moon be confounded, the sun ashamed, everything will be changed, the light of the sun and the moon will be withdrawn, the earth will be no more in its present form. This is presumably the time when it will be destroyed and then rejuvenated marvelously, possibly greatly enlarged, and merged with heaven to be the dwelling place of the people of God eternally. When the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, but they're all figures, and before his ancients, the patriarchs and the ancients, gloriously. So that is Isaiah's chapter on the last judgment. And then chapter 25, O oh Lord, thou art my God, Isaiah now joins the praise of the redeemed, mentioned in verse 14 of the previous chapter. They shall lift up their voice, they shall sing for the majesty of the Lord. Now Isaiah, in his vision, joins with them. And there's this marvellous song. O oh Lord, thou art my God, I will exalt thee, I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things. And here are the wonderful things he refers to. Thy counsels of old, thy word, and thy promises and warnings and undertakings are faithfulness and truth. They've been vindicated. They've been fulfilled. So he marvels at this uh, fulfilling of all the word of God. And then the world that has been destroyed is pictured as a city. This is a world city here. Verse 2, for thou hast made of a city, a proud, proud city of rebellion and unbelief, a worldwide orchestrated system of godlessness, one might say. And heap of a defense city. It had its defenses against God, its atheistic arguments, its theory of evolution, and a thousand other things. A defense city. It boxed itself in 
away from God, but the walls were thrown down and it's a ruin, a palace of strangers to be no city. It shall never be built. This really was the end. This isn't just merely the Babylonian invasion or something of that kind. This is the end. It will never be built. Therefore shall the strong people, those rebels who've been destroyed, glorify thee. In what sense? Of course, they'll be bitter and furious and filled with hatred. But even that will glorify God in a sense because it is their way of demonstrating that the word of God was right all along. The city of the terrible nations shall fear thee. And then, oh, the history of consolation to God's people as Isaiah is able to look back. For thou hast been a strength to the poor always in this administration of oppression. God is our strength, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, all the ways in which God is the protector of his people. I should have given you the heading, this is the rhapsodic praise of God's people. Look at the end of verse 4. It looks difficult in our version. When the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall, what Isaiah means is when all those people with their power attack the church of Christ and the doctrines of Christ and persecute the people of God, whether physically, legally, intellectually, their breath, their hostile breath, which aims to destroy us, it hits not us, but an intervening wall. And that wall is the protective power of God. When the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall, and we're behind that wall, with prayer, sheltering in God, in Christ. That's the imagery. Verse 5, Thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers as the heat in a dry place, even the heat with the shadow of a cloud, the branch of the terrible ones, shall be brought low. I move on to verse 6, the figure of Zion. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things and the various illustrations of the plenty which is provided by the Lord. No mention of Christ. But we realize this is all that has been purchased by him. Isaiah will soon speak of Christ and so fully, more fully than any of the prophets. But here he focuses only on the essentials of, of what will happen and not how they're brought about. There'll be a great feast of good things, of pardoning love and forgiveness for the people of God and joy and peace and light and information. Verse 7, And he will destroy in this mountain, and the mountain of Zion is a figure for the eternal dwelling place of God's people. He will destroy in this mountain the new earth, the new heavens and the new earth, the face of the covering cast over all people. What's that? In verse 7, well, friends, that's the veil of ignorance of God. It's the veil of sorrow which engulfs even Christian people at times. It's the veil of fear of death. It's the veil of separation from God. 
because of sin. And this tremendous veil is going to be swallowed, verse 8, engulfed by God, and death too, swallowed up in victory. And the Lord God, verse 8, will wipe away all tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people, whatever guilt is assigned to them, shall he take away. And all signs of it, from them and from off all the earth, purchased by Christ on Calvary's cross, for the Lord hath spoken it. And then the last heading, a song of eternal victory, as we come to conclusion. And it shall be said in that day, this is the gratitude of the people of God, the truth of God vindicated, all sin and sighing and horror swept away forever, death at an end. Lo, this is our God. The half was not told us. We believed these things, we were taught these things, but we never realized the truth of them as we do now. We never grasped anything of the mighty power and holiness of God in judgment and fulfillment of all the promises. Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. I hope that's the keynote of the lives of Christian people, waiting for him, looking for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. We're not here for a wonderful life. I hesitate to interrupt this, these verses with an illustration, but I remember some 30, 40 years ago reading a book by a lady who lived in Switzerland. She's American, actually. And uh, she wrote a book about, which became very, very popular. I was rather sad it should be so popular, about homemaking. And she was undoubtedly an earnest believer and a reformed believer and a pious woman. But the book, from cover to cover, you could really have given it another title. How to Have a Wonderful Life Here. It was full of the most mouth-watering recipes, ideas for decoration of the home. Everything was to do with the home and me and the family and scenery and walks and pursuits and wonderful, wonderful, happy things. I found it profoundly disappointing because none of that is our priority. I hope you have a happy life. I hope that the way the Lord leads you, you will not know privation and difficulty and hardship. However, the Lord may call you to those things for his name's sake and place you in some place where you have to serve him with a degree of privation and loss and hardship. Glorify him, honor him, but all right, just from a human point of view, I hope that you're able to always eat and live reasonably comfortably. But I hope you never aim at living so comfortably. So much concentration on the home and appearances and happiness and so on. And some of these, dare I call them, patriarchal cults, in the United States in particular, and you see the literature that comes out of them, goodness me, they, they must all be obese. The wonderful eating and food, don't you think that this, this was the greatest priority in life? The homemaking, the wonders of this and of that, the big concentration is on a happy time here. But the Christian priority 
is to be modest and reasonable and to look for the Lord and to serve him and to be fruitful for him and to have that vital balance of the Lord first. This is what we're looking to. We're here just for a season, then above. And these great things are set before us. We're here to honour and serve the Lord. Verse 9 then, It shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited and looked for him. He was our priority and our great aim. And he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest. That's the eternal state. That's the final conclusion. Of course, Isaiah does add, Moab shall be trodden down, Moab representing constant hostility to God's people and be everlastingly ineffective and there'll be total security for the people of God in the eternal realm. And that in two chapters is Isaiah on the last judgment and the song of the eternally redeemed. The destruction of the present world order, the survival of the redeemed, the end of the treacherous dealers, the judgment of demons, and the rhapsodic song of praise in the eternal victory. Everything around us is insubstantial and passing, friends. The great thing is that the word of God will come to pass and be carried through. And here it is in the prophecy of Isaiah. 